In this video, we're going to be exploring starlight. That's topic 13 of the Edexcel GCSE in astronomy. Here we have the specification. You can see we've got a lot to get through. This might take us a while. Um, I'm not going to go through every single point here, but there are a range of different topics that we're going to be looking at. So let's get started. The first thing we want to look at is what we mean by magnitude of a star. If we look at starlight, there are certain things we can see, the colour of the starlight, sure, and we'll talk about what that means in more detail later, but something that we need to be able to look at is what we mean by the magnitude. In other words, how bright the star is. And there are two quantities that we're interested in. One is apparent magnitude, and one is absolute magnitude. And you can think about it as apparent magnitude, how bright it looks to us, and absolute magnitude, how bright it really is. But there's a problem with that. How do we define how bright a star really is? How far away from the star do you have to be standing to decide this is where the brightness, the absolute magnitude, will be measured from? And so the decision was made that the absolute magnitude of a star would be measured from 10 parsecs away from the centre of the star, which is 32.6 light years. It's quite a long way away. It's far farther than the Earth is away from the Sun. So apparent magnitude is how brightness appears to us. And there are a few stars, which you can easily pick out in the night sky, which we say has an, have an apparent magnitude of zero. They are Arcturus and Vega. And it used to be, back in the time of the Greeks, that if a star was twice as bright, then it had a magnitude one lower. So there were, I believe, six categories, six magnitudes that stars were given uh, in terms of brightness. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So that should make six numbers, where s number five was the dimmest of stars. Number four was twice as bright as a number five star. Number three was twice as bright as a number four star. Number two, so apparent magnitude of two, was twice as bright as an apparent magnitude three star, all the way up to zero being the brightest star. So that was the, the Greek system, the ancient Greek system. But it was improved upon tremendously improved upon. Uh, rather than using twice as bright, in order to match some of the magnitudes that they had after better measurements, we went with each interval of magnitude 1 being the same as 2.5 times as bright, or 2.5 times less bright if you're going up in terms of magnitude. So it's a bit of an odd scale, the fact that we've got uh, the brighter stars having a lower magnitude. What we actually mean by that is the brighter stars have a more negative magnitude down here. The dimmer stars have a higher magnitude here. It's a bit odd to think of it that way around, but just go with it. It does, it does work. And we've got a couple of stars that we say are magnitude zero. Anything that's, it's not two times as bright nowadays. We say it's 2.5 times as bright. We go down one on the apparent magnitude scale. So we say 2.5. The interval mathematically is actually more interesting than that. It's 100 to the power of a fifth or the fifth root of 100, which turns out to be 2.511886, blah, 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 um, <clears throat> as you can see here. But it's roughly 2.5. So all the maths that you do at GCSE, astronomy level, uh, NXL GCSE astronomy, you just go 2.5 times brighter, take one away from the uh, relative, for the apparent magnitude. Uh, for the sun, the apparent magnitude is a whopping negative 27. Uh, the moon, we're going negative 13, and so on and so on. So the sun is 14 apparent magnitudes brighter. So that is 2.5 times brighter 14 times. So 2.5 times 2.5 times 2.5 and so on. Or 2.5 into the power of 14. If I chuck that into my calculator, that would be quite a big number, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, it gives us... There it is, 372 point, oh, sorry, 372,529, so nearly 400,000 times brighter. Okay, fair enough. 
Uh, Sirius, very, very bright star, possibly the brightest star that you can see. I think it is the brightest star that you can see in the night sky with the naked eye. Negative 1.5, apart from the sun, negative 1.5 apparent magnitude. Saturn is around about zero. Same brightness as, I think it was Vega and Arcturus. And then we've got the limits of human vision. So you can see as dim as about six or seven apparent magnitudes. Ceres, the dwarf planet, once upon a time was counted as a planet, then downgraded to an asteroid by before being upgraded again to a dwarf planet. Ceres is, is around about seven, so it's just about visible with the naked eye on a really, really clear night with really dark skies. Okay. Neptune, Pluto, I'm sorry, you can't see with them the with them with the naked eye. They're far too dim, but you can see them with the Hubble telescope because that has a limit of 32. I mean, just think how dim an object is to be 32 on this scale. It's phenomenally dim. Right, well, that's astronomical magnitude. So the mathematics of how we can work with these numbers. It starts with having to understand what we mean by logarithms. Okay, because remember when I said that I was 14 apparent magnitudes brighter, that was 2.5 to the power of 14. Well, the power is another name for a logarithm. So powers, indices, orders, exponents, and logarithms, it says here, they're actually all the same thing. So there's our logarithm. 2 in this case, 10 to the power of 2, is the same number as 100. If we write 100, it's the same thing as writing base 10 with a logarithm of 2. It means the same thing. And so mathematically, we can write that number the other way round. Rather than writing the base to the power of the logarithm equals the value, we can write the base here, the logarithm of that base that would give you the value of 100 is 2. This function log returns the logarithm for a particular base, and all the way through this we're going to be using base 10, returns the logarithm for that base that gives that base to the power of that logarithm equals this value, 100. Okay, so it says here logarithm of a to the base of a value, what is the logarithm of this base that gives that value? That's what it means. So here's a few examples of how we combine logarithms. We call these the laws of logs. We have, we have 10 to the power of 2 times 10 to the power of 3. Well, 10 to the power of 2 is the same as 100. And 10 to the power of 3 is the same as 1,000. Well, 100 times 1,000 is 100,000. That is the same as 10 to the power of 5. And what you'll notice is that 2 plus 3 is 5. And this works with all sorts of logarithms. If you multiply these numbers together and the bases are the same, then you can simply write the same base but add the logarithms together. This is actually how a slide rule works, if anyone still uses a slide rule. I do, I do. Um, and similarly, if you're dividing numbers, 10 to the power of 5 divided by 10 to the power of 3, we're using the same numbers as before. That's the same as 100,000 divided by 1,000. That gives us 100, which is 10 to the power of 2. So we would divide numbers with the same base. You are subtracting the logarithms. These are useful rules to know, not necessarily for GCSE astronomy, but it builds up how we can work with the equation that we're going to be deriving in a little bit. So this is our sort of general rule that we've already looked at. We're multiplying values. Logarithms can be added. But this can be written like this, okay? So on the right-hand side, we've got 10, base 10, A plus B. What is log to the base 10 of 100, log base 10 of 100 is 2, okay? The logarithm with the base 10 that gives us a value of 100 is 2. So log base 10, 100 is 2. That thing here is the number 2, plus... This thing here, log base 10 of 1,000, this is the number 3. And 2 plus 3 is 5. And log base 10 of 100,000 is 5. So when we write log base 10 100, that is the same thing as saying 
two. It means the same thing. And we are just saying here that adding two to three gives five. We're just doing it in a slightly longer winded way. Well, why are we doing that? It will come clear in a second. We could do the division version in the same way. We got to this point here where we said uh, base 10 to the power of A divided by base 10 to the power of B is equal to base 10 to the power of A subtract B. Well, it's the same way of saying, look, this thing here is 5. Subtract this thing here, which is 3, equals this thing here, which is 2. It works. The notation follows. If you're not following this, don't lose sleep over it. It's not required for NXL GCSE astronomy, but it is required to derive the equation that you use in GCSE, in NXL GCSE astronomy. So we should use we should use this so we understand the derivation. So here are a few fun rules then. Okay, two times log base ten of 100. Well, log base 10 of 100 is the number 2. So 2 times this thing is 2 is just 4. Sure, okay. But what have we got here? We've got 2 times log base 100. We've also, if we take the 2 and put it up there, so it's 100 squared, log base 10 of 100 squared. Well, 100 squared is 10,000. And the log base 10 of 10,000 is 4. In other words, if we look at this, we've got 2 times log base 10 of 100 is 4, and log base 10 of 100 squared is also 4. In other words, 2 times log base 10 of 100 is equal to log base 10 of 100 squared. If we take that 2 and move it up there, we still get 4. It means the same thing. It doesn't just work with 2. 2 is a funny number, isn't it? Because 2 add 2 is the same as 2 times 2. So we need to be careful. If we've got 2, maybe it's just a coincidence. So let's check some other numbers. So 2 times log base 10 of 1,000. Well, log base 10 of 1,000 is 3. 2 times 3 is 6. And if we look here, we can see the same thing. If I take that 2 and stick it up the top to get this, so 1,000 squared is a million. Log base 10 of a million is 6. It works. Again, we're using 2. Let's try a 3 and see if it works with 3. So 3 times log base 10 of 100. Well, log base 10 of 100 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. Let's take that 3 and let's stick it up there. Well, 100 to the power of 3 is a million. Log base 10 of a million is 6. So it works. In other words, as a general rule, n times log base 10 of a is the same as log base 10 of a to the power of n. This is really useful. This is useful even when we do things like radioactive decay. Although in that case, we're not using base 10. We're using base E, where E is Euler's constant. It's a different number altogether. So another thing to bear in mind in terms of notation is this. If we say the square root, that's the same as something to the power of a half. A cube root is the same as something to the power of a third. So the nth root is the same as something to the power of 1 over m. That's just a notation thing. It's handy to know. Okay, so inverse functions. What's the inverse of a log function? Well, we already kind of covered that. Log base 10 of 100 is 2, and 10 to the power of 2 is 100. So in other words, 10 to the power of something is the inverse function to log to the base 10 of something. Log to the base 10 of 100 is 2, 10 to the power of 2 is 100. Inverse functions. So what does that mean? Well, if I do 10 to the power of log to the base log base 10 of 100, that gives us 100. Well, what is log base 10 of 100? That's 2. We already covered that. And 10 to the power of 2 is 100. So 10 to the power of log base 10 of 100 is 100. And it doesn't just work with hundreds. Log base 10 of 1,000 is 3. 10 to the power of 3 is 1,000. So 10 to the power of this number here is the same as 3. Log base 10 of 1,000 is the same as 3. 10 to the power of log base 10 of 1,000 is 1,000. In other words, a to the power of log to the base a, a to the power of log base a of x is x. We're going to use base 10 instead of base a, but that's a general rule. Raising something to the power is an inverse function to a logarithm. 
logs. That's how you can undo logs. If you've got logs in an equation, you don't want them, raise everything as the power of the base for that log, and the log goes away. So let's do the derivation then. You're going to need some definitions. Now, F is what I'm calling brightness, not magnitude, brightness. So F subscript 10 is the brightness 10 parsecs away. That's the brightness equivalent to the magnitude that we call the absolute magnitude. And F is the apparent brightness. Remember, that's how bright it appears from Earth. F is the brightness that's equivalent to the apparent magnitude. The brightness of something appears on Earth. The thing about brightness is that light spreads out and uh, as it moves away from its source, in each case here, a star. Because the light spreads out, it covers a greater surface area as it spreads further and further out. The surface area of a sphere. Imagine I've got a point light source where my microphone is here. I think you can see my microphone here. As the light spreads out, we end up with a sphere around it, getting a larger and larger radius. And it's the surface area of that sphere uh, that the light is spread across. So the greater the distance away from the object, the greater the area that light is spread across. So because of that, we can say this. We can say that um, the ratio of how bright it is 10 parsecs away versus how bright it is here is going to be the same as the distance it is from us squared divided by 10 squared. Now, this needs some explanation about how we can say this. Well, what's the surface area of a sphere? The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So in the centre of our sphere, we have the star, so that's d, distance units away from us. Then the surface area of the sphere centred on that star is going to be 4 pi d squared. And at the bottom here, that would be a sphere where the distance from the centre to the uh, from the centre of the sphere to the edge of the sphere is 10 parsecs. That's the unit of distance we're using. D has to be measured in parsecs for this to work, by the way. So 10 parsecs away, then that sphere is going to have a surface area of 4 pi times 10 squared. Well, because we've got a pi on the top and a pi on the bottom, they cancel, leaving this. Now, if you're not following that, don't worry too much about it. It's part of the derivation. So let's check that this makes sense. So is if D gets bigger, then F gets smaller, making this number bigger. So it does work out. This equation does work out. Now, what we say for calculating magnitudes is this. This complicated bit here. It looks really complicated. It is really complicated. We're saying that 100 to the power of one fifth. So remember, it's not quite 2.5. It's not quite 2.5. But for GCSE, we might as well call it 2.5 to the power of this difference in magnitudes. And that goes back to the idea that we are simply counting magnitudes from one to another, where capital M is the absolute magnitude and lowercase m is the apparent magnitude. So this is the difference between the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude. In other words, it is how much brighter or how much dimmer in terms of magnitudes the apparent magnitude is compared to the absolute magnitude. And 2.5 times, uh, 2.5 to the power of that difference will tell us how much brighter or less bright it is from this actual brightness it is at 10 parsecs. So this does check out. It just takes a bit of thought to think about it, you know, a bit of thought to get over. So replace the 100 to the power of 1 fifth with 2.5 and go all the way back to all the way back to here. And you can kind of follow what it's saying. OK, you can understand what it means. OK, so let's derive the apparent magnitude equation. There's the derivation. Starting with this, I've just taken the squares outside. You can do that with maths. So instead of d squared over 10 squared, it now says d over 10 squared. And remember, this is the same as 2.5 to the power of the difference in magnitudes between the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude. And I'm interested in this m minus m up here. So I'm going to do log base 10 of this. 
And if I do that, I've got to do the same thing to both sides. So log base 10 of the right hand side gives me this. And now I can use that clever law of logs where I could take this power down to here to get this. And I could do the same thing here. Take that 2 down to here to get this. We looked at laws of logs before, so we get that. We could do it again because, look, we've got a fifth up in this, in this bracket here. So we could take that down as well to get this. Now, we know what log base 10 of 100 is. That's 2. So we could replace that just with 2. Uh, so now we've got this equation here. There's 2 on both sides. The 2s cancel. So we get to this equation here. And remember our laws of logs. If we're dividing these two numbers, that's the same as subtracting one log from the other. We looked at that before as well. So we end up with log base 10 of d minus log base 10 of 10. And we know what log base 10 of 10 is. It's 1. So the right-hand side just becomes log base 10 of d minus 1. And we're nearly there now. Just multiply through the whole equation by 5 to get rid of the 1 fifth. Log base 10 of d becomes 5 log base 10 of d. And we could do d to the power of 5 here. We're not going to. And we've got our minus 5 there because 1 times 5 is 5. That's how maths works. So the way the equation is given to you is at the bottom there. We just made capital N the subject by adding little m to both sides. And there we have it. So what does log base 10d mean? You get your calculator out and you type in log base 10. It's one of the buttons on your calculator, depending on your model of calculator. It might say different things. Anyway, log base 10 and type in the number for the distance to the object D. So you might have to calculate capital M when you know everything else. You might have to calculate lowercase m when you know everything else. You're not going to have to calculate D. But if you did want to calculate D, you could just work backwards all the way up to here. Multiply both sides by 100 and then take the square root of both sides and then you've got D as the subject. So we could just do maths. So the next thing we're going to look at is light from stars and what it can tell us. Okay, well, it can tell us the composition of the star. Here I've got a profile, I think this is a simulated profile, showing a wavelength of light on the x-axis. and On the y-axis is how bright it is, the intensity of that particular wavelength. And you can get a lot of information from this. You'll notice that it's not a smooth curve. If it was a smooth curve up and down, that would look like this, a continuous spectrum what we call a black body spectrum. And all bodies that have a temperature above absolute zero emit that sort of shape of spectrum where the peak shifts depending on the temperature. So we don't quite have that because we've got these dips where some of the light doesn't seem to be getting to us. And those dips we call absorption lines. Because well, they're, they're lines when you measure this spectrum using spectrometry. Or spectroscopy. Spectrometry is measuring a spectrum. Spectroscopy is taking a picture and looking at a spectrum. They're basically the same thing for us. So this is the light we get from the star. This is greatly exaggerated where you've got these black lines indicating light missing of those particular colours. In the lab we can take certain um, substances, hydrogen for example, we can excite it and it gives off colours of certain wavelengths. And it turns out that the absorption lines from our starlight correspond to emission lines from different substances that are excited. And we can work out from this that the star must contain these elements, or these, these substances, because these substances are scattering the light, they're absorbing the light, and then emitting it in a different direction, so it's not reaching us. They're scattering it, and they're preferentially scattering it. They're preferentially absorbing it as they're exciting. I should say that, actually, rather than scattering, because it's not quite a scattering effect. Forget I said scattering. I'm not going to edit that out. So we've got this spectrum here. We can see the uh, the bigger the dip, the more of that, quanti uh, the more of that substance. I'm not going to say element. It should be element, of course, but the more of that substance there is in the star. And we've got a big table. I mean, this is a small table. There's a much bigger table uh, that you can get of the wavelengths 
of these excited, excited lines that correspond to different substances. It says element here, and then it's labelled as O2 rather perplexingly. I don't know whether monatomic oxygen is different. In a star, of course, we've got to be careful with that. Uh, we've also got, I mean, we've got this here. There's two tables side by side here. So it's not one row is one thing. You can count up how many there are there. I can't be bothered. But so they've got different names. So when you get these graphs here, you can see there's different labels on them. They correspond to different elements. The darkness of the absorption line gives you an indication of the amount of that. Well, how can we use that? Okay, we know the star contains hydrogen. There's going to be big dark lines for hydrogen. It's also going to have dark lines for helium. And how can we use that? Well, we can use that to determine how old the star is. Because the older the star is, the more of the hydrogen has been fused. And if we have more and more of the carbon and oxygen and things like that, may, then we know the star's even older than that. And so we have worked out the different ways that elements can be synthesized, that can be created within stars. And there are lots of them. And you don't have to go into lots of detail about these. But basically, you can see, look, we've got helium here, oxygen here, neon, of course. Uh, we've got all sorts of elements. BE, is that beryllium? Iron. We've got all sorts of elements in there. Now, we know from mathematics and from work in the lab, the rate at which these sorts of processes can happen. And so because of that, we can work out if we have this quantity, this proportion of the star made up of this substance, the star must be so old in order to have that proportion of the substance because the reaction rate depends on time like this. And we can come up with an equation. Very, very clever people do that, not me. So we can work out the age of the star by looking at its composition. We can also work out the generation of star. If there's a star that's formed from the remnants of old dead stars that would expect to have higher abundances of some of these heavier elements what astronomers call metals but they're not all necessarily metal in the way the chemist would understand it just anything that's not hydrogen or helium they call metal so we've actually done quite a lot of work on this we as being the scientific community and come up with this chart which i stole straight off wikipedia it's all creative commons as all my images are unless i made them myself which in this case i didn't and it shows where these elements come from you can see hydrogen from the big bang and helium most of it from the big bang but some of it from exploding massive stars some of it and we go down the table what's really interesting is that you may have been lied to this surprised me when I first saw this because you're told that all the heavier elements are caused by exploding stars, by supernovae. Exploding massive stars give you the yellow ones up to, well, what have we got here? Zirconium. Not really the others. So where do they come from? You've got dying low mass stars that give you some of the others. But where about the uranium? We get told uranium. Uranium has come from dying stars. That's not true it turns out there's not even enough energy in a supernova from a exploding massive star to fuse into uranium there's not enough energy for that you need neutron stars merging it's causing an explosion with enough energy to form those and what really shocked me was this there's a big patch around the middle here exploding white dwarf stars we think of white dwarf stars as being near the end of the life cycle of a star, and the white dwarf will turn into a black dwarf as it cools. But it turns out there is a process by which a white dwarf star can actually go supernova. It's a lower energy supernova. Maybe it's not called a, it's a type 1 supernova, I think. I can't remember. You can Google it later. But yeah, white dwarf stars can explode and release these elements. Uh, that surprised me. And the ones at the end here, we have to make ourselves. They don't happen in nature because they need even more energy than that. So the light from the star tells us, or we can work out the age of the star, or what the star is made of. It can also tell us how hot the star is. Because, as I said, all bodies that are above absolute zero temperature emit black body radiation and the spectrum is very well known. So a body that's 3,000 Kelvin, that's pretty hot, it's going to glow red, 
is going to produce a spectrum like this. The higher the temperature, the brighter the object becomes. Spectral radiance, think of that like brightness. But also the peak shifts down in wavelength. In other words, from red towards blue. This 5000 Kelvin is going to look pretty much white because you've got loads of blue all the way around to red. It's got all of the colours there. And you can see that here, I don't know how this red line that's wiggling around is scaled, but the colour thing here is the interesting thing, where when we're cold, 1000 Kelvin, we've got it red, it gets all the way up to look, 30,000 Kelvin looks blue. Higher temperatures are blue, lower temperatures are red, and the middle is white. Not sure what the M means at the bottom. That might be the scaling factor they've used or something. I, I don't know. Again, stolen off Wikipedia, Creative Commons, you can easily find it. So we can work out the temperature of the star as well. That might be useful because hotter stars tend to last less time. So all of this is figuring out what the star is like. But we've got to be careful because when we look at the star, it might be sh the spectrum might be shifted. All the wavelengths might be a bit longer, it might be red shifted. See the one below, this absorption spectrum below, has the same shape of the dark lines. They all correspond, but they've been increased in wavelength because the star is moving away from us. So the wavelengths have all been stretched out, increased. If a star is moving towards us, or a galaxy is moving towards us, say Andromeda is, then we would expect to see a bit of blue shift there. So we can use this to tell if the star is moving away from us by looking where these lines are, and then using that information, correct all the other lines. So we're getting quite a lot of information here. We know how fast the star is moving. If we know how fast the galaxy is moving away from us, we can use Hubble's law to work out how far away it is from us. And that's really useful because we know how far away it is. Rewind, rewind, rewind. And we know how bright it appears to be. We can work out what the absolute magnitude of the galaxy is. And if we know what the absolute magnitude is, we know how much energy it's given off per second. We can work out what the temperature would be and so on and so on. So all of this is just finding information about stars and galaxies from the light we see. So we can categorise, catalogue and categorise stars into different categories. Uh, this is the mnemonic that I was taught. It's not wonderful. Feel free to come up with your own. Uh, but for reasons that I don't know, the categories are labelled O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And it goes on from there. No sensible order to that. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Where O is big and bright and M is smaller, less bright. Orangey red colour, whereas this is a big blue colour. The mnemonic that I was taught was O, B, a fine guy, kiss me. Or O, B, a fine gal, blah, girl perhaps, kiss me. Perhaps not very um, forward thinking but it, it works if you remember it. So these are the different categories that we have for stars, and we can work out what category the star is based on its temperature. We can work out its temperature based on the spectrum of light that we get from it. All this information is useful because we can use that information to plot where the star is on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So the classification, going from left to right, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, across there. We've also got the uh, absolute magnitude up here. We need to know what the absolute magnitude is to plot it. All we have is the apparent magnitude, but if we know the distance to the star, we can calculate the absolute magnitude using the method I've just explained. And so we can say, what's the temperature of the star? What's its magnitude? Bong, and plot it onto this. And we've done that for a lot of stars. And you can see there's uh, sort of bands here, very bright bands, very clear bands where there are lots of stars. And then there are some other categories of stars and how they're named that appear. White dwarfs are down the bottom here. Up here, we've got our super giants all the way up here. The odd star up here, not very many of them. Lots of stars in this middle band down here. So on this... Um, on this sort of, uh, what do we call it, on this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, 
We think that stars tend to move from left to right along their arms, these, uh, these bright arms, as the stars age. That's what we think happens. And there's been a lot of research into this, and you can find confusing diagrams like this, where stars have tried to plot where stars are going to end up going. I'm not sure how much use there is in that. But you can estimate what's going to happen to the star. And based on that sort of information, we've come up with beautiful pictures, again, stolen from Wikipedia, beautiful pictures like this. I don't like calling it a cycle, because it's not really a cycle. It goes in a line. There are lots of branches depending on the mass of the star but you've got the star forming at the beginning and then depending on its mass it either goes the top way or it goes the bottom way brown dwarf is barely a star really more like a hot planet but you've got your sort of low mass stars our star is a pretty low mass star we're here at the moment in the main sequence and after our star gets older it'll turn to a red giant uh, after that, it's probably going to puff out its outer layers into a planetary nebula, white dwarf, black dwarf. Don't forget the white dwarf could explode, of course. And so that's the route that our star is taking. Uh, you could have something like this coming up here, where if you've got a binary star, it can accrete matter and cause a bigger supernova. I don't think that's the explosion of the white dwarf. Maybe it is. The white dwarf accretes matter from the red giant and then ends up supernovaing. Maybe something worth looking up if you're interested in that. Very massive stars tend to be blue. They tend to last less time. You get red supergiants, which supernova, type 2 supernova. And depending on what's left, you could end up with black hole, neutron star. Um, and your black hole just sits there and accretes more and more matter. The neutron star, it could be a very high energy neutron star which spins very fast, called a pulsar, sending out pulses of, of X-rays and gamma rays, or it might, it's also a radio signal by the way, all of them. Anyway, it could be a pulsar or it could merge with another neutron star, supernova, uh, which we think is what happened before where our sun is because we, we've got uranium on earth so that's what we think so what can we do let's just have a summary of the of what we've got so far we've got um, absorption spectrum looking for hydrogen using that to determine redshift which we can use to get recessional speed and we can correct the absorption spectrum uh, for that, we can then use that absorption spectrum to look at the composition and use that to work out its generation, its age. We can use the composition to estimate the temperature. We can just use the spectrum to estimate the temperature, see if those two match up. We can then uh, use the spectrum to look at the class of the star, so we can plot it on our Her Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, using that, we can estimate the energy output of the star. How long do we think it's going to last? Where is it going to go on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? How is it going to drift to the right? Um, and so there's a lot of information there. We can then finally work out the distance to the star. There's a lot of information that we can get. Now, when we measure distances, we're not going to measure them in meters or gigameters because that's that's a bit crazy. That's a bit far. So we use a unit called a parsec. Now this is what a parsec is. It is the um, distance to a star when the parallax angle, when the Earth moves around its orbit around the Sun, the parallax angle is one arc second. So if you look at very very distant stars, we've got a star nearer, when the Sun, when the Earth is in this position around the Sun, then the star we're looking at is in this part of the night sky. But six months later, the star will appear to be in this part of the night sky. And so that means we've got an angle, a parallax angle. And when that parallax angle is one arc second, we say the star is one parsec away from us. Well, what is an arc second? It's a 3,600th of a degree, because one degree is 60 arc minutes and one arc minute is 60 arc seconds so very very small units of angle you've got to be able to convert between them it's no different to converting hours into seconds and vice versa so there we go that's what a parsec is equivalent to 3.26 light years it's a big old distance equivalent to 200 odd astronomical units 
you know, astronomical unit is, as it's labeled on this diagram here, distance between the Sun and the Earth on average is one astronomical unit. So these are huge distances we're talking about. Okay. So these distances measured in parsecs, we can work them out. So I've already covered this. I don't want to go into too much detail. But we can work them out from this equation. Measure the color, locate it, read off the absolute magnitude, go, right, that's what the absolute magnitude is going to be for that sort of star. We now know what m is. We know what little m is. We can work out d. Well, you have to rearrange the equation first to do that. There's the rearranged equation. I said you could do it. This is how you do it. Plug the numbers in. It's not part of your course, actually. So we'll skip over this quite quickly to looking at the light from different types of stars. And we have something called a light curve because the amount of light, the magnitude of light that we get from different stars is not always constant. There are things called variable stars. And as the name suggests, the brightness will vary. The magnitude, the apparent magnitude will vary. As you can see here, over the course of a month, the brightness changes um, quite a lot, actually, three times from uh, 3.6 apparent magnitude all the way up to 4. Point, uh, all the way down, should I say, to 4.1 apparent magnitude. Remember, this is brighter, that is dimmer. And the period of this, you can measure it. The period of this is about nine days, every nine days it has its peak brightness. Uh, this is Kappa Pavonis. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. So that's a variable star. There are different sorts of variable stars. There are long period variable stars as well. And for these, the light curve periodicity is in the order of hundreds of days rather than just sort of nine days. These long period rather than short period variable stars. Um, and you plot the absolute, the apparent magnitude from Earth, and this is what you get. Now, the movement of the Earth isn't going to have that much of an effect, but if you wanted to correct for absolute magnitude, you could do. It wouldn't matter. The periodicity of this particular star, 492 days, 340 days, and so on. Not a lot of information about that one. That's a bold claim that they've made there, isn't it? Anyway. What else might you see if you look at the light curve from stars? So you might see a pattern like this. This is not a regular sinusoidal change in apparent magnitude. This is not that at all. This is a sudden drop. And in this particular case, it drops down and back up again. And then we have a different drop later. And this pattern might be repeated. It might be repeated like this. Big drop, little drop, big drop, little drop. The reason why this is happening is because there are two stars. When they're next to each other, you get the light from both. But when one is in front of the other from our perspective, then the smaller one is going to be absorbing some of the light from the bigger one behind. That's going to cause a drop in brightness. And when it's this way around, it's a smaller drop in brightness. So the dimmer star gets in the way, the drop in brightness is far greater than when we've only got the brighter star. So there's a little bit of a drop in brightness. So that's um, that's your eclipsing binary stars. If you're lucky and you've got the two binary stars orbiting in such a way that the Earth is in the plane of their orbit, then you might see that. And this is interesting because you can measure the time period of that orbit, that the two stars are orbiting each other, and you then use Kepler's third law to work out the distance between these two stars. Interesting things that you can measure from stars. There's PhDs in this sort of information. There are some stars that have a really regular, really regular periodicity to them. And we call these Cepheid variable stars uh, because of the first of them that were discovered, where in, uh, I think it was the Beta, was it Delta Cepheids? I can't remember. One of the Cepheids on your Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, um, they have a very, very particular periodicity of about uh, 5.4 days. All those stars have about the same periodicity. You know, the star gets brighter, it gets brighter, it spreads out a bit, gets a bit dimmer, collapses again, gets brighter again, spreads out again, and it's got about 5.4 days. This is useful because we can, if we've measured a star with a periodicity of 5.4 days, then we know it should be about that bright. 
So if we know it's about that bright, we can look at the uh, the apparent magnitude and work out how far away that star is. So if we look at a galaxy and there's a star in that galaxy with a periodicity of 5.4 days, we can work out how far away the galaxy is. And we can compare that to the recessional velocity and Hubble's law to see whether they match. It's all about gathering more and more evidence for information about stars and galaxies. So we call these standard candles. Uh, so Cepheid variables, as I've said here, uh, there's an interesting one here in terms of days. We've got a lovely graph of how the uh, magnitude varies with periodicity, but you see it tr tends towards a particular number. I don't want to go into too much detail about this, just that we've got a particular periodicity so we can look up what the absolute magnitude is and use that to determine the distance. What else might we see with a light curve? Well, you might see something like this. It's not a nice regular periodic change. It's a sudden increase in brightness in, a, uh, in absolute magnitude. It's been corrected for distance. Sudden increase in brightness, and then the brightness falls away. Now, that sounds like a nova to me, or a supernova. Plural is novae or supernovae. And there are different types, different categories for them here, depending on what has supernovaed. A type 2, they're the really big energetic ones. A type 1, the less energetic ones, but they don't last as long. At least I think I've got that the right way around. So what causes them? There's a table here. You can read that yourself. We don't need to go into a lot of detail about the two different types of supernovas. Supernovae, should I say. Um, but you can see they've got the type 1, where there's no hydrogen present. Um, that's sort of the white dwarfs, perhaps, supernovaing like this. Thermal runaway, don't know what that means. If I'm interested, I might Google it later. Type 2, much more energetic. Um, this is the sort of thing you, you traditionally think of as the supernova. Okay, let's move on. Binary stars. So binary stars are two stars that are linked to each other, gravitationally linked to each other. Maybe they're orbiting each other. Not just a double star, which is what you get when you see two stars near each other in the night sky so close that you can't really discern that there's two stars without a telescope. Now, these two stars are gravitationally linked to each other. And we already talked about eclipsing binaries before. So here's a binary star. You can't see that it's a binary star without better telescopes that can resolve smaller objects. And that's what this looks like with a better telescope to the same scale. So that's, um, that's something to bear in mind when it comes to telescopy. Can you resolve? Do you have the resolving power to tell if there is two stars or one star? Uh, they reckon about a third of the stars are binary stars. They're astrometric binaries where you can't actually see the other star at all. We just determine it's there by making measurements of the light from the big star as it moves around. We say, oh, there must be another binary. There must be another star. It must be a binary star we're looking at. Oops. Hit my tripod. It is possible to measure if the stars are being deformed in shape by making really good measurements of the light from that patch of sky. Basically photographs. You can even see if the stars are being stretched. It's very, very clever what we can do. It's all interesting stuff. So here's a uh, lovely little video from the European Space Organization, I think ESO stands for, showing two stars eclipsing binaries so you can see how the light curves change. Lovely. Uh, this wasn't from Wikipedia, so I've had to reference it like that. This is two stars. Um, easy to see that this is a binary with a simple telescope. What else can we see? We can see star clusters. This is Messier 92 out in the sky. Lots and lots of stars. If we happen to have a Cepheid variable in that cluster, we can tell how far away the cluster is. We get lots of light from these clusters indeed. Um, might be a small galaxy that collapsed in on itself. Not clear. It says it tends to have older stars. Not a lot of metal in these. Milky Way, about 150 of these things across it. So they're, they're fairly abundant. 
This example is Messier 92. There's also open clusters like this, the Pleiades, which you can see quite easily with the naked eye. You get some lovely telescope photographs with this thing. This one is blue sort of color to it. it tends to contain younger stars. Um, you tend to find these in the spiral arms rather than away from the spiral arms, like the globular clusters are. And there's really uh, rich hydrogen. So the, the lots of glow around here is actually light reflected from the hydrogen in that cloud. What else could you see in the night sky? Now, something you can do with uh, light from stars is you can use it to measure how long a day is. Not just talk about the sun going up and down, but you can take a long exposure photograph pointed at a particular patch of the sky towards Polaris if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. A long exposure photograph. So you can see all the colours underneath here are all overexposed because the shutter of the camera has been left open for a long time. So lots of lights got in. And as the light's been left in, the stars appear to have moved around in a circle. Actually, they've not. The Earth is rotated, but that's what it looks like. And it's left this trail. And you can, from the centre of this circle, you can trace this angle, this angular displacement of the star. Now, after one full sidereal day, the star would be back where it started. So the proportion of one full circle tells us the amount of time. So you can measure the time that your exposure was over. You can measure this angle. Well, that proportion of time compared to a full sidereal day will be the same as the proportion of this angle to a full circle, 360 degrees. So rearranging that equation for proportions, just basically multiplying through by little t, sidereal day divided by t would be 360 divided by theta. So a sidereal day is t times 360 divided by theta. Now it's better to make measurements of star trails like this using older star light detectors, photographic film. When light is incident upon the small silver halide crystals, some sort of silver salt, it causes a change. And I'm not a chemist, I'm not fully understanding all of these changes, but again, it's an interesting thing you can look up if you're interested. But these changes cause a defect in these crystals. A photon comes in, a bit of light, uh, messes around with the crystal structure somehow. It says that an atom is left behind because of this change in the crystal structure. A silver atom. And the more light, the more silver atom specks there will be that have been removed from the crystal, the salt crystal. And what we could do is we can expose this film to a fluid, a special developer fluid, a solution, which will um, grow silver on the silver specks. The longer you leave your exposure, the darker your picture will become. Uh, sorry, the longer you leave it in the developer fluid, the darker the, the picture will become. So you have to look at it while you're developing it to make sure it's the right darkness of the image, the right exposure of the image. Now, once you've done that, the silver crystals are grown and you've got rid of the... Um, what's the, the the silver salt you've basically washed that away so now that image is going to stay there you're not going to have to worry about light causing further exposure to the film so the advantage long exposure also very very good resolution i haven't mentioned that very high res far higher resolution than digital cameras and very dim bodies because you can have long exposure you can collect enough light from them to cause enough of these little silver atoms that when you develop it you can see the image so you can see very faint objects the disadvantage is one it's a single use film so you have to keep replacing it but two is this the big one skills time special equipment it's photography par excellence what we tend to use instead nowadays is charge couple devices. The charge couple devices, light comes in, it knocks electrons out, causing a charge. That's all that happens. So we have a panel with lots of these uh, these individual pixels, these cells, which become charged with different light that hits them, and then we have to figure out which bits are charged. We do that by um, rippling the charge off bit by bit. And measuring how much charge there is in this layer. There's no point having a 
a two-dimensional grid showing charge if we can't tell where the charge is. We have to feed it off a row at a time um, in order to determine what pixels were exposed to light. Very clever. Very, very clever. Uh, you'll find these sensors in all sorts of places. The same sorts of sensors on your mobile phone digital cameras. One of the big advantages is that you can process the information digitally. It's a huge advantage because it's already digitally. I've got to scan it in afterwards. Um, you can store them. You can transmit them across the world. You can process them. It's much better. Uh, what you can do for color uh, photographs is you have different colored filters. And what they do on space telescopes is they'll... Uh, put different filters on. They'll take a pic a long exposure with one filter. They'll take it off, put another filter on, do it again. Take it off, put another filter, do it again. And then you can add those images together later on using a computer. On these sorts, they tend to have different filters over different pixels. So some pixels will be red, some will be blue, some will be green. You get more green than red and blue because our eyes are more sensitive to green. So it's to try to produce the same quality of image. Okay. So spectroscopy, which means, just means measuring or taking photographs of the spectrum. How does it work? Well, different colours of light are going to pass through a substance. Some of those colours are going to cause excitation, electrons moving up in energy levels inside the atoms. Some of the colours will not cause that to happen. They can't. They've got the wrong energy. So that colour's been removed. It's not there anymore. So the light spectrum has got a dip in it kind of covered this already so I'll just leave that on the screen for a second so you can read it itself kind of covered this twice as many green as blue in this particular one fine okay so we are taking photographs of stars and galaxies and using that information but there is a problem and that's that the earth's atmosphere is between those stars and us and this is a problem because not all wavelengths of light get through the Earth's atmosphere. Visible light tends to do okay. Infrared, not so much. X-rays, forget about it. It's a real problem with X-rays, gamma rays, real problem with gamma rays. Radio waves, what well, depends. Long wavelengths don't, short wavelengths do. So... This this is a problem. The Earth's atmosphere affects our ability to look at stars. Another problem is our atmosphere also has composition, so it's also going to be scattering light of various colours, which is going to distort the information we get from the stars. You know, if we see dark lines where there's carbon dioxide, does that mean there's carbon dioxide in the stars? Well, probably not. They're far too high a temperature for carbon dioxide to exist. It would disassociate, but we might get dark lines. So what does this mean for us? This means that there's carbon dioxide between us and the star. So we have to do something about that. Either correct for it or stick a telescope up in space. So this is another diagram, pretty popular one on Wikipedia, showing how opaque the atmosphere is. In other words, if it's opaque, doesn't let any light through. Visible light's pretty good. Radio waves, pretty good. Not long radio waves. Everything else, not so good. So we can really only use optical and radio waves on Earth. So for radio telescopes, what do we do with that? We basically have a single pixel camera. We get lots of radio waves arriving, but because the wavelength is so big, we need a really big detector to interact with it. So this really big detector will reflect the radio waves that could be detected at some point and acts basically as a single pixel. It's a parabolic shape, which I'll talk about in a second. Well, there's two ways we can use a single pixel detector to get a decent image. One way is to wait because the Earth is rotating, which means that the part of the sky this is going to see is going to change. Or we could stick this on big motors and sweep it across the sky ourselves and build up an image. The second way is to have lots of these in an array. There's some clever things we can do with combining images from arrays to do with time of flight, which maybe I'll talk about later, maybe I won't. How does the radio telescope work? Parabolic reflector like this, only the bottom bit really. A parabolic reflector, parallel rays coming in will all reflect to a single point. It's a lovely thing about parabolas. So we just place our, our antenna, our detector 
right here, aerial, should I say, right here, we can collect a lot of light that interacts. When I say light, of course, I mean radio waves. We can collect a lot of radio waves to a point, and we can use that. Fine. So we need to understand about resolving power then, because a big dish, it's got a bigger aperture, big hole through which light can enter. So we should be able to resolve smaller objects with this. So this is the general criteria, criterion, singular, uh, where the angular resolution, in other words, how close together things can be before we can tell them apart, is basically lambda over d. It's 1.22. Don't need to worry about that too much. It's basically lambda over d. The 1.22 is almost 1. So lambda over d. Where well, lambda is the wavelength and d is the aperture. So if you want to get one degree resolution, then lambda has to equal basically d. So if lambda is bigger, like with radio waves, d, the aperture size, has to be bigger. It has to be about the same as the wavelength. So if our wavelength is in the order of 200 meters, we're getting 200 meter wavelength radio waves, then we need a 200 meter dish, parabolic reflector, to detect them with a resolution of about one degree. So that's what this is saying here. In our eyes, we have rod cells that are pretty close to, or well, the parts of the rod cell that detects light is pretty close to 500 nanometers, and it's most sensitive to 500 nanometers electromagnetic radiation. So the, the technology in our eye is no different to these dishes. They're just bigger because they're detecting bigger wavelengths. There's another thing we can do, which I don't want to go into too much detail because it's very complicated, but it's called interferometry. So the signals arriving at our different dishes, our different radio telescopes, will be arriving at slightly different times. And we are talking really close timing, just ever so slightly different. We can do some clever, uh, something called interferometry to work out the time difference. Usually you wouldn't be able to measure it, but by combining the signals, you can do something clever to measure that time difference and use that to work out where the light came from, even if you're not looking at exactly that point in the sky. So interferometric radio telescope arrays, you can get loads of information about the sky, even though you've only actually got a few pixels, because you can uh, look at the interference between the signals when you combine them. Very, very clever. Computers can do it very, very quickly. Of course, you need to use computers to do it. Trying to do it by hand is almost impossible. Right, so what can we see with these radio telescopes that you might not be able to see otherwise? Things like quasars or quasi-stellar radio sources. Quasars for short. So quasars are um, probably uh, active galactic nuclei. In other words, the middle of galaxies, but they're absorbing things, so they're uh, absorbing matter. So these, these black holes in the middle of the galaxies are emitting radiation as matter falls into them. Um, we can detect these. They're very, very distant. That's why we get radio waves from them. They're very, very distant. Um, even though they're bright, they're very distant. They're bright because of how much energy we're talking about. We can also see some structure with black holes. We can see, maybe not inside the black hole, definitely not inside the black hole, but we can see jets emerging from the poles of the black hole as the black hole uh, rotates because of the internal charge of the black hole um, or the charge of the region around the black hole that's rotating. So we can see these jets coming out. We wouldn't really be able to see these without radio telescopes. And finally, because radio waves pass through so much matter we can use it to see through the milky way we're in the milky way so seeing the structure of the milky way is really hard if we just use visible light we'd really struggle but if we use you can see the chart the chart here on the on the right with what's different parts you can see through the milky way using radio waves and combine that information from uh, other information to get some uh, better understanding of the structure of the galaxy that we are in other things that we've managed to see we've managed to photograph this is for me spectacular this is a protoplanetary disk a star in the middle and the planets haven't even formed yet they're still forming this is evidence of how planets form 
We don't just guess. When we look at our solar system and just guess all the planets formed because we can see it happening at different stages in history around different stars. And radio telescopy makes that possible. Now we can also do infrared telescopy. So for that means using infrared telescopes. The nice thing about that is we don't have to get right up into space. We can, but we can just stick a telescope on a plane and get above enough of the atmosphere uh, because the atmosphere is sufficiently sparse that we can detect enough infrared. Or we could just stick our telescope on the top of a mountain. I think this is in Hawaii. Stick it on the top of a mountain and we can get some pretty good telescope images. So infrared images, because all bodies emit infrared, and they emit more infrared with the higher temperatures, we can use that to get some absolutely glorious images, gorgeous images like this, that you can see the, um, the pattern of these nebulae, where it's more dense, where it's hotter, just because more infrared radiation is emitted from them. We wouldn't be able to see this without infrared telescopes. Right, because infrared light can't be seen with our eyes, we have to use false colour, colour it different colours for different brightnesses so that we can really see the structure. So with infrared astronomy, we can see cooler bodies, don't emit visible light, still emit infrared, so we can still see them. You know, things like moons, things like planets, we might be able to see them, but we wouldn't be able to see them if we were just looking for visible. You know, we can, we can look on moons and see the structure of moons that are nearby using infrared uh, astronomy. For example, we can see areas on moons that are higher temperature, indicating volcanic activity. Uh, I can't remember what moon this is. It's not our moon, though. So we can look at if there's any seismic activity based on the temperature, which we could detect remotely from Earth using infrared, although we have to be above the atmosphere to do that. The atmosphere causes other problems as well. It causes turbulence. So here we can see you've got a bit of shaking of the... Uh, of the Earth's atmosphere, or caused by the Earth's atmosphere. That's the crater on the left. You can see how the shape and size of it changes depending on atmospheric turbulence. And this thing here is twinkling, twinkling away because of the Earth's atmosphere, changing its colour, changing its position. And the reason that happens is because the plane waves, these are waves all coming from the same place in space, travelling in a straight line to us, go through an turbulent area in the atmosphere temperatures are slightly different densities are slightly different so uh, refractive indices are slightly different so light takes slightly different paths when it comes out the other side it's all wobbly and shaky and the things we're looking at are a little bit less clear so space telescopes why don't we just use space telescopes for everything i mean it'd be lovely if we did because there's lots of advantages the fact that you can have much longer exposure because we don't have to worry about days and nights. Uh, the fact that uh, we can see parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see from the surface of the Earth. The atmosphere doesn't get in the way. The disadvantage, it's the big one, is they cost a lot. They're also very difficult to maintain and repair. If something goes wrong, you've got to get up there to fix it. That's expensive and it's difficult. Yeah, we don't use them for everything. What we do use them for is fantastic. Things like gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, really high energy stuff that we cannot see from the surface of the Earth. We can see it. Now, these sorts of telescopes use a really clever method for focusing. X-ray telescopes, for example, use a metal tube to focus the X-rays because the X-rays are just passed through glass lenses and mirrors and things. You can't focus them very well. Gamma rays, gamma rays in particular. So, um, you know, looking at different parts of the of black holes, being able to look at the accretion region around black holes, looking at coronas around young stars, we can't see some of this stuff unless we are in space looking at these higher energy parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. But there are disadvantages to using telescopes, especially reflecting telescopes, and that's that the telescope itself can affect the image. So if you've got a telescope, a reflecting telescope with a big mirror in the back, and this is just a normal style, maybe a 10, in, uh, 10 centimeter aperture telescope, uh, Newtonian reflector, but even the more advanced telescopes use the same basic principle, a reflector in the back, and then a mirror 
to reflect the image to the side or a sensor or something here at position number three light goes through past it but you've got to hold number three in place somehow now it'd be lovely if we could use clever magnets to hold it in place i don't know if anyone's invented that yet but in the meantime we hold it to, in place with these veins uh, this one has four veins we don't tend to use one vein because the mirror in the middle will shake around too much. Two veins would shake around too much still. Three veins, the same problem uh, if they're arranged like this. If you use three veins arranged like this, that's fairly common. Uh, or four veins like this, fairly common. Three veins is better than four veins because there's less to cause diffraction. But you get these diffraction spikes, these twinkle, twinkle little star bits coming out the side that are caused by these spikes. Not only that, the aperture shape, the shape of the hole that the light goes through, affects the image. A hexagonal shape aperture will produce these diffraction spikes. So the Webb telescope, the, uh, you know, the James Webb telescope, has veins holding the middle mirror in place and lots of hexagons. Look at the mess for this image. You can see really, you know, reasonably large size objects, it doesn't really matter. But you look at very small objects, you get all this diffraction noise that you've got to somehow deal with. This is an example where you've got the typical six spikes indicating a hexagon or three of the um, three of the veins you'll also notice there is a horizontal part going across here so this might be a hexagonal aperture but with four veins holding the central mirror in place so you've got two different diffraction effects happening at the same time i mean what about the lens shape as well that's going to affect things our lens in the case of um a refracting telescope where light passes through it this is much more noticeable if you put your telescope out of focus you see what's on the left here or on the right there depending if the focus is too near or too far the smaller the objects look the closer you are to being in focus but the rows here and here and here show different shapes of lenses where we really want a perfect shaped lens but any slight differences you see the image gets a bit bigger a bit blurrier and that's caused due to the shape of the lens so we've got to make sure the lens is just the right shape there's also something called a comatic aberration so called because it appears to cause a coma around your image so on the right is with the chromatic aberration mostly removed on the left is a big example of chromatic aberration this is caused by light coming in at an angle you want light coming into your telescope right in the middle in other words you're looking right in the middle of the image but towards the edges of the image you'll see more and more of this chromatic aberration if you are using lenses glass lenses because they have a finite thickness and that just causes slight differences in where the light focuses also if you use glass there's another type of aberration you get called a chromatic aberration and don't get chromatic aberration confused with chromatic aberration they are different things so chromatic aberration is when you've got off axis view of an image chromatic aberration is really hard to correct for it's caused by different focal lengths for different wavelengths of light because of their slightly different refractive indices for different wavelengths of light and you'll spot this very easy to spot if you've got a bit of blue on one side of the image and a bit of red on the other then you'll know that you're looking at chromatic aberrations very very common and you get it even with reflecting telescopes there's a small glass lens the magnifying lens the eyepiece lens and even that is going to cause chromatic aberrations and you can do clever things like stacking up stacking up multiple lenses to try to undo it um, but it's always going to be there to a small extent Uh, if you look at double stars, actually we can use some of these artifacts you get on the image to spot double stars. So if you look here, this is a double star, uh, Alpha Crucis 1 and 2. We wouldn't spot it except the diffraction spikes, the vertical diffraction spikes, do indicate that there's some horizontal distance between two stars. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to spot it. So that's really good use of uh, artifact in an image that you might think we don't want it, get rid of it. But actually, we can use it sometimes. 
Um, that could be useful. Uh, here we can see Polaris. It looks like a single star. Get a better magnification of telescope. And we've actually got Polaris A and Polaris B. It's a double star. Actually, we get an even better magnification. Just look at Polaris A. It turns out that there are two stars there as well. A binary star, perhaps. Polaris A and Polaris AB. The closer we look, the better the magnification of our telescope, the more we can see. If you look at binary stars through a telescope, that's what you might see. If you look at clusters through a telescope, then you can make out individual stars. A cluster through your naked eye might just look like a bit of a blurry blob, but through a telescope, you can see individual stars. We've already looked at this cluster before. Uh, no points if you can tell what it is. It's, look back in the video, it's Pleiades, I've ruined it. Anyway, um, looking at nebulae through a telescope, again, you don't just look like blurs, you can actually pull out this sort of structure from it. You can see the colours that you wouldn't normally be able to see. You can see the detail, the shape of it. Galaxies through the naked eye just look like a blurry dot, but galaxies through a telescope, you can see the shape of them, the structure that don't just look like dull dots. And that brings us to the end of this video, all about exploring light from stars. There was a lot to get through. We spent about half an hour just looking at what logarithms were, which, okay, you might not be interested in that because you might not be doing that in part of your GCSE. It's not part of the NXL GCSE in astronomy, but it's good to know. Thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned because we'll be looking at video 14, hopefully won't take another year to make it.